morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com as well at St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Glad to be with you. Today is Friday, second day of November 2018. Handful of things we're going to get into today, but always want to remind the viewer, the listener, the whole thing. If you're interested in being part of the show, you could call 732-364-3598. Or you can comment on the Facebook Live or Periscope feed. Um, we're going to talk a handful of a bit about baseball today. And a couple days ago was obviously Halloween. And my plan was to dress up and we're going to set up a certain costume and just go do our thing in regards to the show. And uh, a couple reasons it didn't happen. And the first one was really more uh, on the somber note of the passing of Willie McCovey. And I just didn't think it would be fitting, you know, doing a show at night, you know, dressed up almost in a mocking way of mocking myself out. And I thought it would take away of the seriousness of talking about a man that spent four decades in the major leagues, a man that hit 500 home runs, was one of the more well-respected major league power hitters of all time. And there's a lot of things you can go if you're talking about the career of Willie McCovey, because obviously... It's hard to dominate and be a Hall of Fame player when you're playing in the shadows with the likes of a Willie Mays. And Willie Mays was one of the best top five, maybe top seven offensive players that the game of Major League Baseball has ever seen. And McCovey spent the majority of his career playing with Mays. And I know Mays left for the Mets in a trade in 1972, so... A handful of the rest of the 1970s, not counting McCovey's time with San Diego and that, that month or so he played with Oakland. And he was he was with the Giants by himself. But, you know, he was a man that was ridiculously respected throughout the sport. And when it comes down to it, you look at his numbers and the thing that stands out to you is the 500 home runs. But for those that watched Willie McCovey play, he really was one of the more feared power hitters that the game had seen at that time. And I think it's easy to compare the game back then to the game the way it is now because you see so many more home runs. But players that can hit home runs today are not the feared power hitters of yesteryear. And I think there was a huge difference because a guy like McCovey had the ability to take the ball out to any part of the field, hit any one of the pitcher's pitches, and yeah, he may strike out every now and then, but certainly didn't strike out at anywhere near the pace of the players that do today. He had several seasons where he walked more than he struck out. So he had a good eye at the plate, obviously was cognizant of the fact that in certain situations, pitchers will want to pitch around him. You look at players with the launch angle and the setup to just drive the ball and hit it in the air, as opposed to being able to and train themselves to hit all pitches. And it's something that you don't see now. And a guy like McCovey and his 521 home runs stand out. And I, I did I did take a couple comments, and I was listening to some people give a point of why they thought Willie McCovey is a borderline Hall of Fame candidate at best. And I could debunk those theories for a number of different reasons. The way, the way that he hit his presence in the game, there was a good five to seven year period in Major League Baseball that he was considered one of the top five players, if not in the National League, but in all of Major League Baseball. Um, the guy won an MVP, won a Rookie of the Year, but like I said, he, didn't, he never did anything flashy. He never had those, you know, that that ridiculous season where he hit, you know, 370 with, you know, 1,000 OPS. But he had some 40 home run seasons. Uh, he was a guy that you know, probably wasn't around the 200 hit mark that often. But a, a guy, and, and I think really one of the better contemporaries, if you're looking to, to compare a certain player to him, I think it would be Willie Stargell. And it was a fair enough comp, and it was a comp that was made during both of their playing careers. <clears throat> Stargell played, uh, you know, ended up playing a couple years later. Of course, his career started a little bit later. So, but for the most part, their careers were kind of intertwined. And really, if you look down and you break down their numbers, you know, started with the 475 home runs, McCovey to four to five twenty one. You can see where they sit in hits. You can see where they sit in batting average and OPS. And 
runs batted in both around the 1,550. So th these these were all different things when you're looking at you know players and you're comparing them. They you know kind of puts them on the same level. And the last player that I have to say that is an absolute contemporary, and I don't I don't think it's fair to this player that he's been bypassed in regards to baseball's Hall of Fame, and that's Fred McGriff. Now, if you can say Fred McGriff, the one thing you could say negative about him is he never stood out as one of the best players in the game. Now, you could say McCovey did that. You could say Fred McGriff did that. And there is no question about it. Both of those players had that particular advantage over the crime dog. But Fred McGriff goes out there, hits 493 home runs. I'm not even going to mention that it's the same amount that Lou Gehrig hit in his career. But when you look at his 284 batting average, you look at his OPS which was right around where McCovey's and Stargell's were. And think about it. Think about what got McCovey and Stargell into baseball's Hall of Fame. And the answer was their power. So if you're matching their power numbers, not just... And, and obviously he's in a neighborhood. He's right in between the two when it comes to home runs. But you look at, you look at a player that I, I just believe is getting an unfair pass when it comes to this generation. And I don't know if it's because of the use of performance-enhancing drugs, the players that are being blackballed because of steroids. Maybe McGriff is considered to be one of those people too. I don't know. i never seen any evidence. But I look at a guy that hit 493 home runs, hit 284, had an OPS right there with that of McCovey and that of Stargell. And I tell you, if you put the three player statistics for their career right up against each other, you see many similarities. And unfortunately, McGriff is not getting the respect that he deserves. Next thing I wanted to hit up, and once again, it's the past ball show brought to you by JohnPielli.com. We're waiting a little bit on Periscope, unfortunately. So I do apologize for the little technical issues that are going on there. Um, following the Oakland Raiders, and I'm going to go, I'm going to talk a little football and then we'll bounce it back and we'll finish talking about baseball today. But the Oakland Raiders ended up being embarrassed yesterday by a San Francisco 49er team. And once again, I say on a past ball show, we want time-sensitive topics. So I don't want this to be about the recap of yesterday's game. You can talk about the story of Matt Mullins getting a chance to play in the NFL, making his first start, having a pretty good performance. And he deserves the credit for what he did, but... Man, I tell you, I, every time I watch the Raiders play, I have more and more of a concern of watching a team that just doesn't seem like it cares. And I hate to say that when it comes to the sport of football because, you know, I know any sport, especially a team sport, players and a team are judged based off of their results. And you look at the Oakland Raiders, and I'm not going to say that they were expected to go to the Super Bowl this year. And you could even say, if you wanted to, that perhaps the Raiders were expected to do pretty bad this year. And you probably wouldn't have been wrong. I'm not saying that I had unfair expectations when it came to the Raiders. But I tell you, you know, when you look early on in the season, there are some very important factors that we're seeing that may make you think that this team quit. And they were not competitive last night against San Francisco. And once again, we're not going to break it down. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not going to go play by play. We're not going to give you a recap of the game. But the Raiders were not competitive at all. Derek Carr didn't look good. You know, the defense, I know it's not the same without Khalil Mack. I know this is a team that is sad because of the trade of their star wide receiver, Amari Cooper. And John Gruden's watching, probably in his own eyes, saying, hey, I want to strip this team down. I want to create my own team. I want to capitalize on the amount of first-round draft picks that I have over the course of the next couple seasons and build the team my way and set this team up for Las Vegas. Now, the unfortunate thing about it is there, I don't know if this was necessarily communicated through the presser when John Gruden was hired. And listen, do you, say, do you expect somebody to do that? In other words, should Gruden have said, hey, my plan is to tear this team down, start from the beginning, and not put a competitive team on the field for at least this year and next year? If he said that, I think people, especially in the national media, 
fans may have been a little upset hearing about it, but I think over time would have respected it. But when it comes down to it, unfortunately, it's a hard way to sell any fan base when you're taking over a franchise. And let's be serious. John Gruden is not just the coach for the next 10 years. He is going to be the general manager. And I know Reggie McKenzie is still there. He probably won't be back after this year. It's going to be Gruden's team. Gruden has got his hands in every personnel decision that's involved in that team. And, of course, there's going to be doubts. There's going to be doubts about can John Gruden still coach the NFL the way it's set today. And I think that's a big issue. I think that's going to be a concern until John Gruden fields a team that is competitive enough to go out there and play week in and week out. Um, a team that's not going to embarrass itself the way it really has in a handful of weeks this year. And he's still looking. You, you look at a guy like Derek Carr, and you know I'm not going to say that he's on the borderline of being a top five NFL quarterback, but he's certainly in the first ten or dozen or so. And if you release Derek Carr or if you offer Derek Carr in a trade for another team, you'd have a bunch of teams that would say, hey, I would give you a number one for him. And remember, you know, number one draft pick in the National Football League is almost it's almost unsacred to think about trading a number one pick. Like you might as well trade you know a a Hall of Famer in the middle of their career than trade a first round draft pick, and that's the way people feel in the NFL. But I, I think Derek Carr could certainly get you a a number one pick back. Now the question is, do the Raiders want to trade somebody like that? Because I don't think quarterbacks like that grow on trees. And I'm not saying Derek Carr has proven himself to be a Hall of Famer. He hasn't proven himself to be the best of the best. We haven't seen him in the playoffs, and when we have, we have we haven't seen him play. Remember a couple of years ago, Raiders made the excuse me the playoffs, and Connor Cook ended up having to play because Carr was hurt, and that was a, he had a very good regular season. There's no doubt one way or the other whether he would have or would not have played it well in the playoffs, but. You know, the, the Raiders have to make this decision. And I, I tell you one thing, too, and I know I've heard other people echo these same opinions. It's not like the draft class in regards to college quarterbacks next year is on the level or anywhere near the level it was this past year. You got a Teddy, you know, you know, you got Teddy Bridgewater, who was a free agent. And I think he has got the ability to step in and become a starter. And if it wasn't for the fact that the quarterbacks that are in, coming in the draft are not as you know dominant or prolific as they were a year ago, you know a guy like Teddy Bridgewater may not have much of a chance next year. Now that's the same reason why he's sitting on the bench backing up Drew Brees in New Orleans. But Derek Carr will probably be starting for somebody else next year. Now the question is: Do the Raiders go get themselves a rookie quarterback? Or do they feel like there's somebody that maybe could run Gruden's offense a little bit more or a little bit better or a little bit more to John Gruden's liking? Because John Gruden can't be happy with anything he sees right now. And it's not a matter of whether John Gruden's system is working. Whatever is being done by the Raiders, whether they're doing things John Gruden's way or not, it's not working. And you're watching a team kind of fall from grace, going from being a team that had some exciting young players over the last couple seasons, are going right into the dumpster. And you expect them to rebuild and have some very good young players as they get set for the move for Las Vegas. But it's amazing, you know, you watch a team with a top 12 NFL quarterback and see them competitive, uncompetitive week in and week out. So a reminder, the Castro provides maximum protection against viscosity and thermal breakdown. As we swing back into baseball, I did want to mention um, something I was looking up the other day. and it, You could look at the career stats of a Pete Rose. And Pete Rose had a great career. Pete Rose absolutely belongs in baseball Hall of Fame. You know, those things like that, I don't think are even worth the discussion. We could have that conversation. You can say, hey, Pete Rose gambled on baseball. He cheated. But the one difference between what Pete Rose did and what anybody else did that's on the ineligible list or is on the black ball list through the collusion of the Baseball Writers Association of America and the Veterans Committee. 
Pete Rose may not be a good guy. In fact, he's probably not. Pete Rose was a degenerate gamble. Pete Rose bet on baseball. But there was never any proof that Pete Rose bet on any games as a ball player. And if you watch the way that Pete Rose played the game, you notice that there was no way that he would ever impact the game in a negative way. They called him Charlie Hustle for a reason. They were, you know, you look at a guy like Manny Machado is about to hit free agency. He can certainly learn a lot from watching Pete Rose and watching the way that he played the game. He played as if every game was going to be his last. And the reason I bring that up is because the last series of years of his career for a lot of other players would have been their last. And I understand Pete Rose, as he got towards the end of his career, was starting to look at some records. He was starting to look at the chance that he had very reasonably to get 4,000 hits. And he knew if he pushed it a little bit further, it could break Ty Cobb's record in regards to all-time hits. And, you know, he had, Ty Cobb had 4,190 hits. Pete Rose ends up with 4,256. The 1983 season, in my opinion, and just looking back at it, was an absolute albatross. And probably was the turning point in P. Rose's career from becoming a very good, useful player to a guy who you were, question, you were questioning his value whatsoever. And I asked this question, and I know there's a lot of Philly fans that pay attention to the show as we hit the concluding point of the passball show. A couple more points, and we'll call it a day. Be back with you tomorrow when we do our NFL picks. A couple other things going on in the world of baseball, sports, and Unified America. Could the Phillies have won the World Series in 1983 if they had somebody else playing first base outside of Pete Rose? And the reason I bring that up, Pete Rose's season, probably one of the worst ones that you've seen for a regular player. I know about four or five years ago, Michael Young playing for the Texas Rangers, coming off a season where he drove in over 100 runs, hit 338, had a pretty good OPS, and had a below replacement level season after that. People wanted him blackballed from the sport. They wanted him out. They wanted him to just quit. Pete Rose in 1983 had a worse season than that. He hit 245. He had a 602 on base percentage. His OPS plus for that season was 69. So if we use 100 as the barometer of being average... Over 100 is better than average. Below 100 is below average. Pete Rose sitting there at a 69 for a guy that had 118 OPS plus throughout his career, for his entire career. Many times in his prime, averaged between about 130 and 150. So just talking about where the guy was to where he fell in 1983. And there's there's really, it, it, it's very excusable. You know, you can't knock Pete Rose and say, man, he just turned into a bum overnight. He was 42 years old in 1983. He was fulfilling the last year of a five-year contract that he signed with the Philadelphia Phillies, which, by the way, 1980, 1981, 1983, he gets up to the playoffs three times. They win a World Series. They get to two World Series. So it was a very valuable contract for the Philadelphia Phillies. I'm sure the Phillies were paying in the last year some of the money that was kind of earned through the first part of that deal. And certainly what was earned over the course of P. Rose's career with the Cincinnati Reds. But it has to be known that P. Rose was terrible in 1983. He scored 52 runs, had 121 hits, had 14 doubles, 3 triples. 245 batting average, 316 on base, 286 slugging. And I know... Pete Rose was never looked at as a power hitter, but in the early part of his career, the first half of his career, he, he was about a, a 10 home run a season guy. Didn't hit any that year. The one thing that stood out about Pete Rose, a doubles machine. The guy was there, 40, 50 doubles, year in and year out. And on a bad year, he's sitting there at 35. He's playing in 151 games that year and had 14 doubles. And like I said, the goal here is not to knock P. Rose and say that all of a sudden he was a bad player or he was useless for the 1983 Phillies. Though I do feel that maybe if the Phillies had acquired a legitimate power hitting first baseman of that time, you know, I throw on the other side of the diamond to the World Series champions of that year, the Baltimore Orioles. 
let's say they had an Eddie Murray. I think that swings the World Series in the Phillies' favor, and they're talking about being champions for the second time in four years. Obviously, you're talking about something that happened 35 years ago. So I don't think there's any Phillies fan that's worried about that team and that team not winning a World Series. Obviously, a surprise that they made it as far as they did. I know they were very dominant in the 70s. They culminated their run with a World Series championship in 1980. But, you know, 1983, you looked at the likes of Rose and Joe Morgan and Tony Perez and guys who were nicknamed the Wheeze Kids as a kind of a spoof of the 1950 Wiz kids. Guys who were probably past their prime. And Rose stood out, was probably more past his prime than the others. But, you know, Pete Rose, obviously, you know, as, as much as he respected the game, which I believe he did. I believe he loved playing baseball. And I think of Pete Rose and Alex Rodriguez and guys who were vilified for different reasons. But one thing that I'll never take away from either one of them is their love for the game of Major League Baseball. And, you know, a couple of years ago when they were both uh, doing pre- and post-games for the playoffs, you know, their discussion on hitting, their discussion on about passion for playing Major League Baseball, that's something that's incomparable. I don't think you could go along the lines of players in baseball history and find too many of them that were up on that level with the amount that they cared and the amount that they loved the game from Pete Rose and Alex Rodriguez. But he gets to the point, 1983, dismal season, Becomes a free agent, but obviously has a one-track mind. 3,990 hits after the 1983 season. He's playing somewhere. He's going to sign a contract with somebody, and he's going to get to 4,000 hits. He's going to get to 4,190. And the Montreal Expos sign him. And I'll tell you, you saw a lot of the same thing in the early part or the first half of the 1984 season. And it's amazing how a little bit of a change or a little bit of home cooking could make a big difference in a guy's career. And you could tell Pete Rose was excited, he was motivated, and it's not like he wasn't motivated before, but all of a sudden you see a guy hit 365 in 26 games when he all of a sudden, at the same time, inherits the role as the manager of the team. And you think after that season, when he's over 4,000, you know 1985 at some point he's going to get close enough to get that all-time hit record, that he's probably going to be able to do it. But we have to understand, and it's just for a simple fact that he went through traditional depreciation as a player. And you can look at the late 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, and talk about all the players that were probably supposed to decline in the second half of their careers as they hit age 35 and up, and especially if they approached and past age 40. Pete Rose had a natural decline. Now, his natural decline stuck around for, what is it, five years? Or, what, <clears throat> four years? 83, 84, 85, 86, four years? When a lot of other players in a similar situation might have called it quits. But listen, he got the all-time hits record and was a guy that should be in baseball's Hall of Fame. But once again, 1983, terrible season for him. Phillies get to the World Series. I don't know, maybe an outside-of-the-box thought to perhaps add themselves a power-hitting first baseman in the second half of the year. Maybe playing every day at first with Rose coming off the bench. Maybe Rose getting a chance to play first base with that guy DHing in a World Series. Just a reminder, this copyright and broadcast is authorized under internet rights, granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for the entertainment of our audience. Any publication or reproduction other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of the show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPielli.com and JohnPielli LLC, is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of a program, such as by charging admission for its showing, is similarly prohibited. Once again, we'll do NFL picks tomorrow. Last topic I wanted to hit up, and if you follow the title of the show, you'll see what the teasers were. I'm staying to it today. We're going to talk a little bit right now about Luis Tion. And Luis Tion, obviously one of the more impactful players to ever come from the country of Cuba. 
there's a handful of players that are playing out there in Major League Baseball now that look up to a Tiant and say, you know, thank you and appreciate the impact that he had on Major League Baseball paving the way for the players of yesteryear and today. And I looked at Luis Tiant's stats, and the first thing that's told to you when you look at Luis Tiant's stats is that it's not all about the stats. And I understand a couple of years with the Indians in the 60s, a couple of years with the Red Sox in the 70s, he wasn't on the best teams. And he was the best pitcher on what you would call a marginal team at best. A team in Boston that made it to one World Series in 1975. A team in Cleveland that never made it to the postseason. A couple of years with the Yankees that didn't get to the postseason. The Pirates, who are a World Series champion in the 70s twice, didn't make the playoffs with them. 1982 Angels made the playoffs, but that was last the last season that Tion ever had. And I wanted to make his case because I think he's a guy you want to root for to be in baseball's Hall of Fame. A representation. I think we, if you think of what you would call the intangibles, I think Luis Tion checks a bunch of the boxes. You could say a guy like Derek Jeter had intangibles in addition to what he accomplished on the field, but he also had 3,600 hits. He also won five World Series champions. Ships. He was one of the better players of his generation, and it was pretty known. The intangibles stand out when it comes to Luis Tion. But I wanted to count, and they say, the experts say, if you have anywhere between 8 and 10 Hall of Fame seasons, it should really not be a doubt of whether you're in. 10 should be absolutely no question. 8, the discussion is very heavily in your favor. So the first one that stood out to me is I looked at the 1966 season. And if you broke it down, he started the season or had a handful of relief appearances. And he also had 16 starts. So he relieved 30 times. He started 16 times. He had seven complete games, five shutouts, and eight saves. So I would say, and I, now I wouldn't want to give it a credit for a full point, but I would say it was pretty close. Next year, 12-9, 274, 213 innings, 219 strikeouts. I'll give that one to him. 68, 21 and 9, 160 ERA. And obviously, we're talking about the mound being higher, being lower the next year. Nine shutouts, 264 Ks, absolutely Hall of Fame season. 69, he has 9 and 23, 71. No. Twins next year, 1970, makes 17 starts. 71 with the Red Sox, makes 10 starts, 11 relief appearances. Finally, you move on until 1972. 15 and 6, 191 ERA, 43 games, 19 starts, 12 complete games, 6 shutouts, 3 saves, 179 innings. I'll give that season to him. 1973, 20 and 13, 334, 272 innings, 206 strikeouts, yes. Now, 1974, even though he won 22 games and had 7 shutouts, 311 innings, 176 strikeouts. You gotta give it to him. Absolutely. So we're at one, two, three, four, five. Next year, 18 and 14, 402. No. 1976, 21 and 12, 306, 38 starts, 19 complete games, 279 innings. Because of the wins and a low ERA, I'll give that season to him too. So you look at the rest of his career, 12 and 8, 473, 13 and 8, 331. 13 and 8, 391, 8 and 9, 489. And in the last two seasons, he had made 9 and 5 starts, respectively. So I'm totaling 7, but the reason that these are 7 is that I am going on the optimistic approach with Luis Tia. I'm not going to be a critic or critical of the 1966 season where he only made 16 starts. You have to factor in, if I'm saying it's a Hall of Fame season, it's a season that he made 16 starts. The other season, 43 games, 19 starts, 191 ERA. 19 starts, 24 relief appearances. So I'm given two Hall of Fame seasons when maybe I shouldn't. And another season, it was 12-9 and nine in a day where wins matter. So 
I'm really only talking about if you subtract those three seasons, four Hall of Fame seasons. And a guy that finished his career 229 and 172. 2,400 strikeouts. 49 shutouts. 187 complete games. Was a very good pitcher in that generation. Pitched almost 20 years. If there's a Hall of Very Good, Luis Tiant would be there. But not in the Hall of Fame. A little bit of a recap of the show today, and I do once again want to thank everybody for tuning in. This is the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLE.com. Luis Tiant, great, very good pitcher, doesn't belong in baseball's Hall of Fame. Pete Rose, if he wasn't on the 1983 Phillies, if they had another first baseman that basically filled in for him, maybe had a little more power, I think the Phillies would have won the World Series in 1983. The Oakland Raiders... I think it's going to be embarrassing for a while, and it's you're going to have to wonder at one point, is it the talent there being so bad? Does the coach not have a clue? Or has that group completely just dismissed the coach and quit on them altogether? Obviously, the sad passing of Willie McCovey. May he rest in peace. Hall of Famer, absolutely. Comparables to Stargell and Fred McGriff. And Fred McGriff's not in the Hall of Fame. And I hate to use the passing of Willie McCovey as a way to promote Fred McGriff, but he, in my opinion, is the one player that I think needs a case made for him. We got Alan Trammell in, and Zubby, I do want to say I can't see your message. How's it going? Hope everything's going well. One last thing I wanted to get into, and it actually isn't related to the world of sports. And this is something on a local front, so if you're following anywhere throughout the country, it may be something that you don't care about, but there was a there was a really bad car accident that happened over in Jackson, New Jersey, impacted a market in which, you know, I know the family and a lot of people that are involved with that business. And it was a shame to see a business, you know, destructed and destroyed like that. And yeah, you, know, you believe, you know, with insurance and the fact that, you know, the honesty is that they want to get things running as, and rolling as quickly as they possibly can, that they're going to be up and running again soon. But there were lives at risk there. Some people almost died. And you're looking at a business that's going to be in bad shape for a long time. And obviously, my respect to the Glory family is out there. Great family, couple generations. They've run that business. They've done a great job. They're pillars to the community of Jackson, New Jersey. And the one thing that ticked me off about that whole thing was the reporting of it. Because if you watched NJ.com or the APP or any of the local papers that were reporting about this traffic, traffic accident that impacted this business, their number one concern was the delays that it was causing in the traffic. They could have cared less if anybody died. They could have cared less if that business was blown to smithereens and ruined beyond recognition and everybody in there died. They could have cared less about that. They What they care, cared about is the people that were reading the story wanted to be assured that at some point traffic conditions within those couple roads were going to be okay. And that's a terrible job. And the news media that we live in today, which is all about reaction, it's all about drawing the headline up to where somebody is like, wow, look at that. So obviously you throw the picture of the damage to the building in there because that makes people say, ooh, and ah. And you spend the whole article talking about something that you think is relevant to them. Because anybody that's reading that article wants to make sure that the intersection where that accident took place that traffic is going to be okay at some point. That's all they care about. Terrible job by the newspaper media. So I did have to get that out there. Once again, you know, Willie McCovey, Willie Stargell, Fred McGriff, very similar players, very similar power hitters who could hit any pitch out to any part of the ballpark at any time. Um, Zubby, just want to remind you, I, I focus a lot on baseball on this show, so hopefully... Hopefully we get the discussion going forward. If you talk to your grandpa, I'm sure I can share stories with him about things that have happened in baseball history. 
Um, we are going to cut it short, though, because i gotta, I got to make a run. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Once again, this is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Also brought to you by Billy Staples, author and motivational speaker. Be back with you tomorrow. That's when we'll do our NFL picks. ton of stuff we're going to get into in the world of baseball, sports, and unifying America. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.